Good morning, everyone. This is Karen Thompson with Ask Resource Center, and we will get started shortly. Um, you are here for the Learning Over Lunch series, and this particular episode is Music Therapy, what it is and how it can help. Please stand by. Hi, Shelly, I see you're on. Hi. Hello. <laughs> We've had a little bit of a staff shift here today. So okay. um, I'm going to be producing the webinar with you. So tell me, would you prefer, do I advance slides or are, do I give you the screen to advance? Or do you just want to talk or do you want the screen as well? Um, I think I would like to advance the slides. Okay. If that's okay. And this is Karen, I assume? This is Karen, that's Hi, right. Karen. <laughs> I am going to make you the presenter then here. Okay. Okay, so do I need to respond with show my screen? It should just show your screen. Hmm. It's pull, something, pull something up. Okay, I guess <laughs> there's so many things from this go-to webinar. I'm like, ah. <laughs> okay, so here's my PowerPoint. I'm just going to play it. Do you see it? I do not see it. So try, uh, do try Wait. asking the question or answering the question, yes, show my screen. Okay. Okay, we'll try again. Can you see it now? I cannot. Hang on just a second because I lost one of my panels. Okay. Oh, yep, I can see it. We're good to go. Yay. So then will I be able to see the chat box? Um. It is really hard to be the, you can see it, but it's hard to be the presenter and manage that. So I'll okay. keep a watch on that off to the side. And if people chat in the box, I will let you know what they're asking you as we go. Sure. Well, the reason I ask that too is I'm going to ask. I'd like to kind of know who is attending and what their backgrounds are and maybe like the populations and ages they're working with so I can make it more applicable to them. Um, Let us, um, that's actually a hard thing to do on a webinar because you'll have people okay. who won't be able to answer you very easily because sure. of the type of device they're watching or listening on. Okay. Um, so let me pull up registrants and I will kind of let you know. Okay. Well, I guess I can't while we're in the broadcast mode, so I'll have to get it to you after the fact, but um, <laughs> I believe we have about 10 registrants for this, and most of them either work in the healthcare system or the school system. Okay. Um, a couple are family members. So those are who are registered, and then the question is, are you know, how many will sign on? The other thing to remember is that oftentimes, one person registers and then they might have two or three other people sitting with them in the room watching the webinar. Okay. Uh, so we may not have access to that information until we're all done and then I can kind of let you know. So I would say in general speak to individuals who are probably working with school-aged kids, either um, kids who have special health care needs and are involved in a clinic system or who have IEPs and are inv involved in a school system. Okay, so you think mainly school aged, not uh, not adults with special needs. Mainly school aged. Okay. And young adults, you know, um, but still school aged, like even maybe eighteen to twenty one. But I bet most most of these folks are going to be um, younger than that, eighteen and under. Okay. Good. That's kind of my target market. So. <laughs> Perfect. 
The other thing is sometimes they know that the recording is coming. And so sometimes if people registered and then they aren't able to join us, then they, um, they, you know, they watch for the recording to come after the fact. So we often get double and triple the numbers that were on the webinar watching it afterward. So you want to speak to those audiences too. Good to know. Try to advance through your slide so we can tell that that's happening. Sure. And you know, I um, <laughs> I clicked the box to not to hide my cursor. I was like, oh, I think I want my cursor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead and leave your cursor on. I don't. How do I do that? Do I oh, to to click to the next slide? There. Oh, so you click on this. Do you have it in um, production mode? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. So your view isn't currently in the view that you would use if you were showing it to an audience. Change your view. So go, yep, right. keep going, go up to the, and then you should now um, click on that slide, like click your cursor so it recognizes you're on a slide. Now go to your arrows and you should be able to arrow over on your keyboard. Right. Yep, right. It's, there you go. But I was hoping to pause this video. <laughs> That's all right. We'll figure it out. You might find that a little menu bar comes up within the slide on the video. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, so it has. But if I can't see my cursor, oh, see, now I can see my cursor. OK. Yeah, cool. I was going to say, I can see it. So I can see it on this one. So then I can pause. Oh, okay. yep, there you go. Did you see the little okay. box that popped yep, up? Yep, I did. Okay. Sometimes there's just a little bit of a delay because it's, it's you know, connecting through another communication component. Sure. Yeah, so it looks like we're good to go for Perfect. my end. How about yeah. your end? Okay. Yes, we're good to go on my end. Um, I It's not quite noon yet, so... We'll wait for a few minutes and I don't, I'm looking to see, let me look at the attendee panel. Yeah, we don't have attendees yet, so we'll give it a couple more minutes. And sometimes that happens. We end up with no attendees during the webinar and when we send it out, everybody that registered clicks on it and watches it and so do a bunch of other people. So sure. it turns so out is- that we just are producing this today and we don't have a live audience. That's not that uncommon. Okay. And who do you generally just send it out to the participants or do you send it out to your whole email list? We send it to our, uh, we send it out to the participants specifically and then we announce it on our um, listserv blast and put the link to where it's housed on the YouTube channel. Okay. So then they just go there and can watch it. Gotcha. Then it- do we do I need to stay on after after the webinar is finished to wrap anything up or how does that work at the other end? Nope. Once we are all done, I will thank you and I'll tell everybody we're logging off. And as I log off, it'll hit exit screen mm-hmm. and I'll hit exit screen. And when I do that, it, it disconnects you and us. So it'll okay. just it'll go blank on you. So you'll be good to go. All right. All right, we're at 11.59. 
How's the weather there today? It is freezing. Yeah. <laughs> This was cloudy, and is it windy, too? It's sunny. It's just oh. very, very cold. Uh, yeah. Hi, welcome. I see people joining us. We're going to give it just a couple more minutes for a few people to get on that are registered. We, I, I want to give everybody a chance to get, get their lunch and get sat down at their computer, and we'll get going. It is noon, but we're going to give it just a couple more minutes. Um, we have people, I can see people joining. So I want to give it just a couple minutes and let people join. So we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. And again, if you just joined us, we are just waiting for a couple minutes. I can see people in the process of joining. So just hang with us for just a couple of minutes here while people get a chance to join on and we'll get started. Welcome everybody. We're going to give it one more minute and then we will get started. I can see people hopping on to the webinar, so we want to give them a chance to get all logged in and settled. And we'll give it just a couple more seconds and we'll get started. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to get started today with learning over lunch. Um, my name is Karen Thompson and I'm here with Ask Resource Center for the Learning Over Lunch webinar series and I have a little bit of quick housekeeping to do with you before we get started. Um, you have all joined the webinar in listen only mode which means your microphones are muted however if you have a question for our presenter feel free to use the chat box on the right side of your screen. If you happen to have already minimized your menu bar, you can just click on your little orange arrow and your menu bar will show back up with the chat box available for you. Our webinars are recorded, so you'll be receiving an email after this with access to the recording and with the handout, as well as a link to a short training survey. And we would really appreciate if you would turn the training survey back around to us. We need that data in order to know that we're providing the web want to listen to, to improve on our quality and to make sure that our grantors and the people who provide the funding for these to continue know that we're doing the work we promised to do with them. So please do turn that survey back around for us. With that out of the way, today we're pleased to host Shelly Peterson, Certified Music Therapist, Neurologic Music Therapy Fellow, and a founder of Kids in Harmony LLC with locations in Central Iowa and Northern Colorado. Through Kids in Harmony, Shelley provides private music therapy, group music therapy, and adaptive lessons to children and adults with special needs. With over a decade of experience in early childhood music and use of music therapy with her own children, Shelley has seen firsthand the power of music for learning, calming, enjoyment, making connections in the world, and connecting with others. Today's webinar, Music Therapy, What Is It and How Can It Help, will provide an opportunity to learn about music therapy, what it is, 
and what it is not, and to discover the clinical applications of music, including who can benefit from music therapy and where to go to find a trained music therapist in your community. And now we're turning it over to our presenter. Shelley, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Karen, for having me today. I'm very excited that um, I was invited to be here. And thank you, everybody who has joined us today and for your interest in learning more about music therapy. Um, I just want to start out saying if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to um, jot those down in the chat box and I can address those as they come in and Karen will let me know. Um, otherwise, if you want to wait till the end, that's fine as well. I'll have a few little pauses in within the webinar here for you to ask questions. Um, I also wanted to real quickly talk about the handout. Um, my presentation roughly goes along with what is um, put in the handout, but I made it just so it could be a quick reference for you. Feel free to make copies and share them with anybody else that you feel might be interested in learning more about music therapy and, and knowing about um, the information that's on this page as well. And at the end, I will be sharing resources um, to learn more about music therapy, which are also found at the bottom at the handout. And all of these um, links are available at my website, kids, www.kidsinharmonymusic.com in the resources section. So if you lose the handout and you find me, you can always find those links. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started and tell you a little bit about me, um, a little bit more than Karen shared with you. Um, I grew up in De Des Moines, Iowa, and um, I always felt like I would want to kind of settle back down to Des Moines, so I kind of had that in mind before going off to college. Um, I went to the University of Northern Iowa and studied music there and discovered that that's what I wanted to do was music therapy. Um, I had the delight of having a wonderful science teacher in high school ask me a question that helped lead me to why or to my decision into um, going into music therapy. It had always kind of been something in the back of my mind um, that I would do, but I really wanted to attend the University of Northern Iowa and they didn't have a program. So his question just helped lead me back and he, he asked, what, what things do I like? And, and my, my answer was, I want to work with children, I like science, and I also like music. And music therapy is a great combination of the three. Um, I don't always work with children and I do enjoy working with other ages as well, but that's just kind of been a, a large passion area for me. Um, so after going to the University of Northern Iowa and getting my BA in music, I went to the University of Iowa to get a master's and equivalency in music therapy. Um, an equivalency is something that you have to get before you can uh, be a board certified music therapist. And so that's for people who have already gotten a degree in something else, they will get an equivalency in music therapy, which will bring them up to par with other music therapists who have a bachelor's degree in music therapy. There are master's degrees in music therapy as well as PhDs. Um, and there are two programs in the state of Iowa that offer music therapy, the University of Iowa as well as Wartburg. And they are both very, very good, high quality programs. Um, after finishing my coursework, I did my internship in Madison, Wisconsin at Central Wisconsin Center. So I have experience working with um, adults and children with very severe and profound developmental disabilities um, in that setting. And then I went on to work in Minneapolis, Minnesota area, um, working with young children, early childhood music classes. Um, those are kind of my barometer to tell me what's typical and what's not. Um, so I like to keep a good combination of working with special needs and working with typical children. So I kind of have that gauge. Um, as well as I started at uh, an Alzheimer's unit um, at a nursing home. So I have uh, experience with the older adult population, dementia, as well as hospice. 
Um, so I took the opportunity to work for a couple of music therapy business owners in Minnesota, knowing that I would need to come back to Des Moines and closer to my family at some time, um, which that opportunity arose in 2007. And so that's where Kids in Harmony was born. Um, so it's just kind of grown from there with the needs and the interests of people in the community. And I'll tell you a little bit more about who we serve later on. Um, so I love this quote, music's a powerful thing. A song can change your mood, make a memory. One song can change your whole life. And really this quote kind of sums up how I got into music therapy as well as the, the question from my science teacher. In fifth grade, I learned the song 50 Nifty United States. And in that song, I learned all 50 states in alphabetical order. And to this day, over 30 years later, I still remember that song and can reference it. It's not quite as good in my memory. I might have to practice it a bit, but it does come back to me quite quickly. I find that that's so powerful in that I can remember that over 30 years later. And that was a very important song to helping me decide to like, hey, what is this about music? Why do I still remember this song? Because I remember in eighth grade, three years after learning it, that I used that song when I was taking a test to help me um, list all of the capitals of the states. And I believe I did them in alphabetical order, just as in the song. Um, but as I became an adult, I also used music in different ways. I would have my cleaning playlist that I would use which was always Natalie Cole um, or Nat King Cole. So all those old jazz standards kind of get me in the mood for cleaning. You might want to try it. And most recently, I had a song that was very important to me called Fight Song by Rachel Platten. Um, and the, the words take back my life really resonated with me at that point in time. And so um, I knew that since I was making such strong connections with music, that I knew that it was important to other people too. So I want you to imagine this. I'm going to share with you a, a little bit about um, this little guy that I worked with. Imagine being a mother, a new mother of a little baby who's very sick. He had some heart surgeries um, and issues and so was in the hospital for quite a long time after his birth. This is a second child, and so you know the difference between kind of a typical birth experience and babyhood and then um, that of this new little one who seems to be so fragile. Um, I was referred, or he was referred to me um, by a speech therapist because in those first months of life and spending time in the hospital, there are many things that they needed to do to help him survive. And so some of these invasive treatments were suctioning um, of his nose and his mouth so that he could have a clear airway, which were necessary in order to help him survive and be comfortable. Um, but they had a negative impact on his life later on when he wasn't so fragile and his family wasn't able to give him kisses on the cheek or kind of love him like you would, you know, a typical little baby. And so um, his speech therapist was working on poss the possibility of, of offering foods or at least tastes to his mouth and he just really did not want anything to do with it. Um, so I came into the picture with this wonderful family who was able to and very willing to follow through with some of the ideas that I had. I took the suggestions from the speech therapist and I applied what I knew about music therapy in this situation. And I'll be honest with you, this was not a situation or a client that I ever thought I would be working with. But I said, you know what, let's give it a try. Um, and so I applied those suggestions from the speech therapist and I wrote a song about giving kisses. And so it starts out with um, 
the toys giving kisses to this little boy at different parts of his body, farthest away from his mouth as possible, starting out. And as he is okay with it, moving oh so slowly closer up to his head. And then once he was able to do that and enjoy that um, and not just tolerate, you'll see that he does smile and enjoy it. Um, we were able to have him give the kisses to his toys and then his family was able to give him kisses on his cheeks. And so this is an example of, of how we can use music in a different way to help with the quality of life. So I'm going to be a myth buster today and I'm going to tell you first what music therapy is not. And this is just to educate you a little bit. Some people might um, have some experience with music therapy and other people might have heard a lot about music therapy in the news. Um, music therapy was used to, to with Gabby Giffords to help with her recovery from her gunshot wound to the head. Um, helped her regain her speech as well as her walking, um, but not it's not always really clear what music therapy is, and it's really hard to know unless you are seeing it. It's kind of a see it to believe it sort of a thing. Um, so I just wanted to share that music therapy is not purely music entertainment. Many, many people can provide music as entertainment. Music therapy is not music education. The purpose behind what we do is not to educate people about music, but it's for other reasons, usually. Music therapy is not music performance. And it is not simply just music listening. Although music therapy might contain some or all of those things, and from an observation standpoint of an outsider looking in, it might appear that music therapy is these things. But now I'm going to share with you how music therapy is different. Music therapy is the applied use of music and the relationship developed to improve a person's life. So the applied use of music, it's very intentional we think and plan before we even get together with our clients or patients or people that we serve and we figure out how we want the music to affect them and what we want to do with it. So it is goal oriented. It is powerful. It's non-threatening, non-invasive. We're not giving shots or anything like that. We don't even have to touch. We don't even have to get close if they don't want us to. And it's non-pharmacological, so we're not using any medications or things like that. We're purely using music and the motivation and the power that it holds. Um, one example, too, that might help you um, understand a little bit about music therapy, because all music therapists are um, board certified. So MTBC, that means music therapist board certified. And so in order to become board certified, we do, we finish our four years of school or the equivalency that I talked about earlier. In addition, we finish a six month full time clinical internship. And then only after that point are we able to sit for our board certification exam. Once we pass that, then we get the credential of MTBC. So MTBCs are using music therapy. 
um, if you didn't know anything about your brakes, you wouldn't try to fix the brakes on your car. I'm not a doctor, so I don't diagnose anyone. Music therapists don't diagnose. I'm not a nurse, so I don't even think about giving shots. So music therapy is the applied, you just have to remember that intentional, applied use of music. Simply listening to music may be therapeutic, and it is, I use that all the time myself, but I don't consider it music therapy because I don't have a plan. Music therapy is very similar to speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy in that we do an assessment on several different domains or areas of function such as cognitive skills or communication skills, motor skills, emotional skills, social skills, those things. And then we develop a treatment plan. So it's written down, our goals are written down, our objectives are written down. And every session we take data and we have information about how the client is meeting those goals every single session. So that's the difference between music therapy and all of those other things that are not music therapy. I'm gonna pause just for a moment to see if there are any questions about what I've talked about so far. And to take a little drink. Yes. <laughs> there are no questions in the chat box at this time, so I am just reminding attendees that if you have a question, feel free to use the chat box. Um, type out what your question is and hit send, um, and we will respond back to you with an answer. We'll read the question out loud um, so that Shelly can respond back to it. Thank you, Karen. No one's typing at this time. I think you can go forward. All righty. Um, I'm one little backtrack about the goal-oriented, intentional aspect of music therapy. Um, a lot of what we learn about in school is, is the elements of music and the psychology of music. And we take anatomy and we take psychology and all of these different courses, as well as working with populations. And so it's, it's the elements of music, and there's so many elements of music, it's, it's really hard to just take and pull back to one, one thing. Um, but with some clients, that's really important that we use very, very simple music and simple rhythm. But the research tells us with another population, it might be the complete opposite. Um, and the presentation of live music versus recorded music is important with music therapy as well. Many music therapists prefer using live music because it's adaptable. So we can see what the responses are of the person that we're working with in real time. And we can adapt our music and our interventions accordingly in the moment. Um, all right. So on to the next slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so music therapy is evidence-based practice. If you go to the website for the American Music Therapy Association, they have many different fact sheets about different populations that music therapists work with. And they provide a broad array of research findings working with those populations. So specifically, um, autism spectrum disorders, the research has shown um, that music therapy is an emerging intervention by the National Autism Center, and that was um, stated in 2015, which is a big deal. Research has also shown that music therapy for young children with autism has improved their communication skills which can lead to, if, if, um, if individuals with autism or any other type of issue, even regular kiddos that are learning to talk and communicate, if they are unable to communicate their needs and wants, it often leads to behaviors. And so learning these communication skills can be very important in their lives on a daily basis at home, at school, anywhere that they go. Um, it, is, it has helped them to improve interpersonal skills, personal responsibility that may elicit joint attention, which is engaging with somebody else, 
enhance their auditory processing and their sensory motor skills, as well as gross and fine motor skills. Music therapy can also assist individuals with ASD in identifying and appropriate, appropriately expressing their emotions and may increase social engagement in the home and in the community. Music therapy in medical populations has shown benefits to reducing anxiety and stress, reducing the need for pain medication, and increasing comfort, positive changes in mood and emotional states, active and positive patient participation in treatment. Music therapy has shown to decrease the length of stay in the hospital. In addition, music therapy may allow for emotional intimacy with families and caregivers, relaxation for the entire family, and meaningful time spent together in a positive, creative way. Music therapy can oftentimes help normalize that medical environment that isn't quite so comfortable and home-like. Moving on to mental health, music therapy and mental health has shown to reduce muscle tension, improve self-image and self-esteem, decrease anxiety and agitation, increase verbalizations, interpersonal relationships, improve group cohesiveness, increase their motivation, and be successful and safe um, emotional release. Oftentimes, it's easier to express ourselves in a nonverbal way through, like through music than it is verbally through talking. And so that's how music therapy can help some folks. Um, music therapists can work in music education and special education. And it has shown that the music therapists can work as consultants in these situations um, as direct service and supporting IEP goals. Um, also providing in services in order to assist teachers and staff in supporting integration ideas. So music therapy has also been shown to be helpful in pain management, reducing the perception of pain, reducing cortisol in healthy adults, which cortisol is that stress hormone, and reducing that reduces the stress. Um, can again reduce the need for medication, reduces pain, fatigue, and anxiety related to cancer and other medical treatments. It can provide for positive changes in mood and emotional states and decrease length of stay in the hospital. Um, another thing that is a little bit different than we've heard already, music therapy can benefit um, patients through improved respiration, lower blood pressure, improve cardiac output and reduce heart rate as well as relax muscle tension. Two more categories here. We've got young children, music therapy with young children and the research says it's a multi-sensory modality. And so music isn't just sound. You can see it, you can hear it, and oftentimes you can feel it. You can feel the vibrations of a guitar. You can feel the vibrations of a drum. Um, I remember working with this one individual who had a brain injury and was neurostorming and so was very, very restless and had no, um, it was very difficult, didn't know where he was in space or anything like that. And so I worked with an OT and we really gave some sensory input into him, which helped him regulate his sensory system. And the vibrations were very important in that. Um, music therapy encourages play to occur naturally and frequently. It's very highly motivating, calming, and relaxing. Not all at the same time, but how we want to, um, how music therapists present it and the goals behind it, we can, um, we can use music to motivate or to calm or to relax. Um, it can help with management of pain and stressful situations. Encourage that socialization, self-expression through nonverbal communication as well as motor development. And another thing that is very helpful with young children is music structures time. 
it provides a predictable structure for them which allows them to develop a quick sense of comfort and rapport within the music therapy environment. And the last category here with habilitation. Um, music therapy can help with developing socially appropriate behaviors and interpersonal skills um, and helping to eliminate those maladaptive behaviors. So um, self-stimming types of behaviors. Um, Music therapy can help develop cognitive skills related to daily functioning, um, develop constructive use of leisure and recreation time, or uh, remediate communication skills. It also can or improve mood and effective states and quality of life. So based on that research and what we already know, then we can use music therapy interventions and develop them to address these goal areas of communication skills. And that can be just vocalizing. It can be verbalizing what they want. It could be pointing at pictures and using the instruments usually as a motivator to do that. Um, we can use music therapy to improve cognition, cognition attention, and memory, um, as in the mnemonic with the 50 Nifty United States. Um, physical, gross, and fine motor skills, emotional goals, social skills, behavioral issues, coping skills, as well as music skills. Um, and we do have some individuals we work with, um, and our focus is music skills because they want to learn how to play a musical instrument. However, they wouldn't be successful with a traditional music teacher. And so we use adaptive interventions to help them learn how to play an instrument. Okay, so here's another individual that I have worked with. This is a young adult, um, fetal alcohol syndrome as well as autism. And so there's many things going on with this individual also displays um, obsessive compulsive type behaviors. And so I'm using music with him because it is very engaging. He, can, he will engage with me, not for an entire session all the way through, but for bits and pieces throughout. He is often seen or appears to be in his own world. Um, although he does have some verbal skills and he will have conversations, um, his attention often goes inward. So I'm working with him <clears throat> to increase in his engagement with me, regulate his sensory system, um, decrease his sensory seeking behavior. Um, he would often look into the lights or you'll see at the end, he wants to repeat things over and over and over and over again. Um, and I'm I um, use rhythmically, very rhythmically, three, two, one, stop, or all done to help him be okay with ending and understanding it's, we can move on. We don't have to keep repeating these things and to maintain his attention. Um, so here we are, we are uh, singing a song that he prefers. He knows the words to it. so. Um, that's important, we'll talk about in a little bit.
and that was a really big deal for him to only do that twice at the end. Um, so that was really good for him. Another thing is I was having him cross the midline playing the beat. And you could tell he was has he is a great beat keeper. He could keep that beat as long as he was, as he was attending with me. And that was a really long time for him to attend as well. And he got back on track when I reminded him, you know, keep keep playing along. You got it. Um, so another um, problem that many of my the families that we work with have is they're experiencing caregiver stress. Behaviors of their child at home that they don't maybe have the skills to manage. And they're busy going from treatment to treatment. And so that's where we come in and we can provide some convenience for them. We come into the homes when we see individuals. And we see them in their home and comfortable environment as well. And so, um, as you can imagine, there are some um, some challenges to that, as well as some very positive things to that. And so the challenges just kind of create more opportunity to help us help them to transfer their skills to their daily life even more. Um, I've thought many of times to, to look into some clinic spaces and I've decided, you know, I think it is more beneficial for us to come into the homes just for that reason so that we can help as much with their daily life at home and transferring those skills um, as we can. And I don't think we'd have the same results in helping the families if we had a clinic location. Um, another example of a person that I worked with, um, we'll call her Lily, with autism, demonstrated anxiety, especially in new situations. Um, I would have a schedule for her at the start so she would know what to expect. And it would put her at ease about the order of activities in the session. I taught her songs for coping and she was able to independently apply them to stressful situations, um, as particularly one that her mom reported to me. She had an EEG test done, and she sang to herself one of the songs, and the name of the song is called I'm Okay When Things Don't Go My Way. Um, and it gives different examples of situations where things might be different than we might expect, but we can be okay with that. Um, and so she was able to successfully navigate that situation. I had another client who um, was canceling a session because he was going to the dentist. And I asked mom, I said, oh, just out of curiosity, how does he do at the dentist? And she told me, terrible. They were thinking about putting him out with medication the next time so that the dentist could do what he needed to do. And I said, would you mind if I tried to work with him a little bit and see if that helps? And so for a couple of sessions before that appointment, we did. We worked on some a, a song about going to the dentist, and we just we sang about the process and what the dentist might, might want to do. And after the appointment, the mom reported to me that it's a small step, but it was a huge deal. He opened his mouth for the dentist and allowed him to count his teeth. Um, so that's just a starting place. Um, and again, things that I'd never really thought of being able to do as a music therapist, but it really warms my heart that I can help these stressful situations and help these families get through these types of things as well as their children. Or um, some problems are facilities. They might be looking for ways to enhance their programming or ways to engage their patients because um, they might be an inpatient unit and you know, there's only so many nursing hands to go around and nursing hands are working on nursing things. They're not there to entertain the kids. So um, oftentimes videos get put on the TV and the kids will be watching a lot of those during the day. And so they're bringing us in to engage with the patients. Um, 
they're looking for, you know, it's positive, it's effective, it's social, it's engaging and connecting to others, which is so important. Um, I have a facility that we have a contract with that we work with a lot of individuals who have had traumatic brain injuries. Um, I'll just kind of explain a few of them to give you an idea. Um, I learned oftentimes with a brain injury might also come a vocal injury. And so I worked with one individual who, um, you know, had a very typical voice, um, loved to sing and perform for his family and record himself and um, talked about going on American Idol and things. Um, but after the injury, his voice was very monotone and he talked like this and couldn't change his voice up or down very much. Um, due to the injury, his volume of speaking was also affected. Um, and so we worked on his lung capacity and some vocal exercises, and we were able to increase his vocal range from just a, a few little notes, if you're musical at all, about a minor third, um, up to an octave before he was discharged. And his mom was so happy that, that he, she, got her son's voice back and it was you know it was more like he used to be um, and he had some expression in his speaking um, another individual who had an injury a brain injury um, was having very um, rigid movements from her arms it was good that she was still able to move her arms and, and work on that. But what I found in working with her and um, with my neurologic music therapy training is that a different time signature was very helpful for her to gain some fluidity to her movement. And she was aiming, she had targets that she was aiming for to play the drums. So two different drums um, and her arm would just moved so much more smoothly when we played music in 3-4 meter rather than 4-4. Four, four. Then there was another individual whom I worked with um, had an infection and uh, brain injury from that. Had a really difficult time gaining control of his body and when I saw him in his hospital bed he was almost in the shape of a C sideways. So he's laying on his back and his legs and his um, shoulders and head were all going towards one way, but his waist was going the other way. And so it made him look like a C. And he was all very, very rigid and tight muscle tone as well. And I found that progressive muscle relaxation with him was very effective in gaining control of his body and over the course of six minutes of, of playing and improvising on the guitar and singing the directions to him to straighten out his body, he was able to straighten out his body and he looked so much more comfortable. So those are just a few of those examples in facilities as well as at home. Um, do we have any questions out there yet, Karen? I have one question for you. Okay. And it is around sort of um, seeking referral or ability to utilize music therapy. And um, this person is indicating you may have touched on that before he joined the call. Um, so um, if that's the case, if you could just repeat any information about, uh, you know, if somebody wants to add that to their child's or their student's um, sort of uh, therapy protocols, who, what professionals do they reach out to to seek that referral and how do they receive that approval? Sure. Oftentimes referrals will come um, from social workers. Um, but really a referral can come from anybody. Um, if, if you think that somebody that you're working with that music therapy might be very beneficial for, um, just you can feel free to just reach out directly to myself or um, 
the team in which you're working with this in individual through. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about funding at the end, so I think I will touch on that part later in the um, more of the referral process, but generally for our in-home clients, the parents are calling us directly. Um, they might have been researching and, and seeking it out themselves, or they might have had another professional that they've been that's working with their child suggest, hey, you know what, they respond really well to music. Have you thought about music therapy? So some referrals might be coming from speech therapists, occupational therapists, um, physical therapists, as well as case managers. Um, I know several case managers in the area that have worked um, on, on getting some waiver funding to, to pay for services. Um, at one of the facilities that I go to, which is inpatient, they require a doctor's order before music therapy works one-on-one -on -one with their patients. And so um, the, the team, the therapy team decides, hey, you know, I think this individual would be appropriate for music therapy. Then they reach out to the doctor to get a doctor's order. Um, sometimes it's the parents, uh, maybe in a school situation, who might be requesting um, information about music therapy or, say, you know, asking, can you look into this for my child because they respond very well to music. Um, so I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, please follow up with, with something else in the chat box and, and I'll try um, to make sure that I, I get you your answer specifically. Um, I think we're good to go on that question and this okay. is your 15 minute uh, notice. We've got 15 minutes left on the webinar. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so we'll move on quickly to why music. Why, why do you use music? Why? why? <laughs> um, and the research shows that music can gain and maintain attention. Music also is, um, activates many different areas of the brain. And so, um, you know, we know there's a movement center of the brain, and we know there's a speech center of the brain, and they do have some connections to other areas of the brain, but nothing activates the brain um, that I'm aware of as much and, as in, in so many areas of the brain as music does, because there's so much. There's melody, there's harmony, there's pitch, there's bass line, there's um, force, there's volume, there's timbre, there's so many things that go along with music and so the brain is activated in all these areas because of all of these elements of music I believe. Um, rhythm, um, many of our movements as well as speech are just naturally rhythmic. So walking, your arms swing when you're walking, jumping, running, talking, all of those things just are naturally rhythmic. Um, music allows for interesting repetition of skills. If you ever, uh, if you exercise to music, you, know, you might find that you can do more exercises if you have motivating music on than if you don't. Um, I kind of, I've, I've kind of um, experimented with some different workouts, and I've found this one online workout that I'm just like, they're good workouts, but they're just pretty blah because there's no music to them so I have to add my own music to them um, and that helps me to work harder and music is enjoyable for many people and and powerful at the same time um, Dr. Elizabeth Stegemuller uh, she's a neurologist at the at Iowa State University and she also happens to be a music therapist she has provided um, a, th a theory about why she thinks music works and how it works. And it really um, resonates with me. I think it's a great theory. Um, her quote is, music therapy has the unique ability to promote neuroplasticity through the increase of dopamine production, the synchrony of neural firing, and the production of a clear signal. And what that means is music therapy can aid the changing brain 
and the damaged brain and help it to make new connections um, through using preferred music with patients because we know preferred music increases dopamine production. The rhythm of the music is the synchrony and so the rhythm of the music can actually help fire the neurons in the brain to make these connections. And we found that noise can negatively affect neuroplasticity. And so music has a much clearer signal than noise does. And music has been shown to um, improve neuroplasticity. So all of those things combined help to explain how and why music therapy works. Um, so here's just a few pictures of, of us working with people. Um, on the bottom right there is an adaptive lesson. On the top right, that's an individual music therapy session in a home. And on the left there, that's early childhood music. Um, and we also, um, with our early childhood music classes, they're fully um, integrated. We allow anybody into our classes and we welcome anybody um, with special needs. So if, if you are working with anybody who you know is maybe in early intervention and they're interested in music, one of our early childhood music classes might be a good first stepping point to say, hey, you know, how are they responding in this group situation? Um, because kind of a little trial um, of what how they might function in music therapy and, and benefit as well. Um, but the rest of our clients, um, we work with um, English language learners in uh, Des Moines Public Schools. Um, and we're learning, we're, we're learning that they can really pick up the English language with the rhythm and the music that we're using. And it's also our program is helping them make connections to other students that are English language learners whom they might not have been in contact with previously. Um, we teach adaptive music groups as well, um, maybe at facilities that serve children with special needs. Um, we could also do adaptive group um, classes, you know, for, uh, for groups, homes with adults or group homes with kids, or um, usually our adaptive groups are for people with special needs. And, and we aim to help them be as successful and independent as possible in those groups. Um, we do work with re pediatric rehabilitation. Uh, we also still have some older adult groups and hospice patients. Um, and in the facilities we're working, we're working in the public schools, preschools, daycares, um, clients' homes, as well as facilities. And here's the funding that I was um, wanted to make sure I got to. Um, music therapy for Kids in Harmony, anyway, is funded by private pay, facility budgets, um, Medicaid waivers through the consumer choice options. Uh, there are many grants and scholarships that um, people have found to fund music therapy. Um, and some organizations also have a uh, foundation. And so the, some, the foundation money can also pay for music therapy. And there are some who are very creative. They've asked for gifts from family members. So often we'll have a few grandparents that are paying um, out of their, you know, privately paying out of their pocket for music therapy for their grandchild. Um, and then um, I'm, insurance is definitely something that has been successful in other states. I'm kind of just at the starting points of figuring out if, you know, if we can get some insurance reimbursement as well within the state of Iowa. And it sounds like the big thing is if music therapy is excluded on specifically on their plan, then they can deny music therapy. But if music therapy is not an exclusion specifically on their plan, then from my understanding, insurance should be able to pay for music therapy services. So that's where we're at as far as funding. 
Um, and I love as Oliver Sacks has been a great supporter of music therapist or music therapy, um, and he's a well-known neurologist. Um, and his quote: "I regard music therapy as a tool of great power in many neurological disorders because of its unique capacity to organize or reorganize cerebral function when it has been damaged." All right, are there any further questions that have come in, Karen? There are no other questions at this time, and this is your five minute marker. Okay, perfect. I don't know how I did this so well, but I'm right on track. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how, if you are interested in learning more, how do you gain access to music therapy services? I have four open spots for free 30-minute consultations with you to talk about your specific questions, your specific situations, how music therapy can help you. Um, I have them over the next couple of weeks, next Wednesday, December 13th, and the following Wednesday, December 20th, between 12 and noon. So you can email me with your phone number by next Tuesday, December 12th and reference this webinar, and um, I can talk with you in much more detail about your situation and how music therapy can help you, um, or how we can work together, or how, you know, if you're not in central Iowa, how you can find a music therapist somewhere else um, as well. So that's my, my email's right there, kidsinharmonymusic at gmail.com. It's also at the top of the handout, so you it's um, you've got that information there um, and one other way that you can find music therapy or even more information about music therapy um, is by going to the Iowa chapter of music therapy um, there are about 90 or so music therapists in the state of Iowa right now many of them are working in hospice care um, the American Music Therapy Association, they have the fact sheets that I mentioned that talk about the research and, and what the evidence is, careers in music therapy, um, and you can also request a list of music therapists in your area, um, and they will share that with you. There's also the certification board for music therapy. Um, you can get more information about music therapy, but they don't have contact information for specific music therapists. I recommend this site to verify the credential MTBC of someone who you are thinking of working with um, for music therapy. So everybody who has who, who is a board certified music therapist is on that registry. So if you've been talking to somebody who, who maybe is telling you that they're a music therapist and you want to check them out, um, you can just type in their name and the state that you're looking in and they should pop up. So that is a good verification tool for you to know if somebody has that credential and the schooling um, behind that. So um, that is all I have unless there's other questions. And I just, go ahead. There is one final question. Okay. Um, that I see at this point, and that is, can you speak to the frequency and duration of music therapy, or does it depend on diagnoses and need? Haha, <laughs> you got it right there at the end. It is dependent on the diagnosis and the need, and really the individual, oftentimes the age and what they can handle. Um, younger children generally is uh, 30 minutes um, and one time a week is what um, most families can handle as far as financially. Um, but there are some instances where we're able to work with individuals more than one time a week um, and for more than a half an hour. It, it, we have to do the assessment first in order to determine um, the frequency and, frequency and the duration. Um, that the treatment, you know, the effect of the treatment might need. So, um, unfortunately, there's not an easy answer to that, but usually it's between a half an hour to an hour. And generally, we see people once a week, and that's usually just due to financial. 
Wonderful, thank you. And let me check my chat one more time. There is nothing in the chat currently and nobody typing at this point. So I think we're good to wrap. Um, and I just want to say thank you again so much, Shelly, for coming on with us and providing all this great information. Remind everybody that you have your handout available for you there. We will also send it out when the recording of the webinar comes out for you. And uh, again, a reminder to be sure that you um, do complete the evaluation. Let us know what you thought of this session, other sessions you might want going forward. Um, and turn that back into us so we can use it for data capturing and continuing to provide people the information they want. Um, I'm going to check the chat one last time here. No more questions. You are off the hook at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again so much for joining us today, everybody, and watch for future webinars um, as you receive your Keeping You Informed emails. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Have a great day. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.